Open your Bibles. So last week we were very privileged to have our um, final visiting speaker, Paul McKinnon, come and preach on Psalm 139, which is a real blessing. And uh, before that, I'm sure you'll remember, it's been a while, but uh, you remember last time that we were in Matthew, we were looking at the miraculous signs that uh, Jesus has performed in his ministry. Remember, we, uh, we spent some time thinking about the, the purpose of the signs of that Christ, the miracles that he performed. Talked about that, and we uh, considered um, the fact that the signs were really an authentication of his, his, uh, the fact that he's a Messiah. It proved that he is the Messiah sent by God, and that his apostles were sent by him. And so it was a real testimony to unbelievers. And we considered whether or not we should expect to see Christians performing the signs of the apostles today. So that was our last time that we're in Matthew. If you see in chapter 4, um, the last thing we looked at was in verse uh, 23 through to 25. So Jesus went throughout the all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And so his fame spread and the crowds all got together. And so this week we're going to continue in Matthew from chapter 5 and we're going to begin the Sermon on the Mount. Now I'm sure you've all heard of the Sermon on the Mount because it's known as the, the world's greatest sermon preached by the world's greatest preacher. So we're in for a real treat. We're going to spend probably a few weeks looking at the Sermon on the Mount. So it opens up, the sermon opens up with this section called, which they call the Beatitudes. You might have a, a little uh, title in your Bible there. The Beatitudes, it's taken from the Latin word Beatitude, which means supreme blessedness, supreme happiness. That's what it means. So uh, let's read verses uh, 3 to 12, first of all, just to remind us of what the Beatitudes are. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. So today we're going to be looking at that first one there in verse 3. So in some ways it's the most important of the Beatitudes, the, the foundational one, blessed are the poor in spirit. Or in other words, supremely happy are those who feel terrible about themselves. That's what uh, Jesus is saying. And hopefully at the end of the sermon, that sentence will make a lot more sense to us all. So let's read that verse one to three together. Maybe we could all read it with one voice. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's just pray one more time that God would open our eyes and ears to hear him in his word today. Lord, thank you so much for this sermon that you preached, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to see, to hear, and accept the things that you've got to say to us this morning. Lord, please show us the glory of your name, the glory of your character, the wonder of who you are through your word this morning. And awaken our souls to joy, Lord, to take joy in you and you alone. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So just looking at this passage here, we see firstly that Jesus saw the crowds. Who are these crowds? Well, they're the ones who have gathered due to what we just saw in chapter 4, verse 23 to 25. The people that saw the miracles. And remember, the purpose of the miracles is in order to point to Christ. They're signs that say, here's the Messiah. To verify his message and to gather the people together. And so all these 
People have gathered together. So Jesus sees these crowds and he's ready to teach them. So what does he do? He goes up, first of all, on the mountain. And that's quite significant. It's not a mistake that Jesus is mirroring the actions of Moses. Now, who was Moses? He was a a great prophet of God who went up on a mountain and God spoke to him. And then the law of God was given through God's angels on that mountain to Moses. He came down and he proclaimed to God's people the message of God. So here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we see him going up onto a mountain to deliver to his people the law of love, the gospel of the kingdom for his followers. He went up onto the mountain and then he sat down to teach. And uh, as you might be aware, when we see Jesus sitting down to teach, the implication is that the people are standing around him to listen. Of course, we know that uh, throughout the church history, we've seen lots of different styles of uh, preachers. You know, there's quite a few churches throughout church history where the preacher would be sitting down and all the congregation would be standing up to listen. It's uh, historically been the other way around from what we do. Can you imagine if you were standing for the the duration of the whole sermon while I was sitting at the front and speaking. At least we'd have less people going to sleep, right? So <laughs> might be something to try out. But Jesus sits down, he begins to teach the people. Now, when the Messiah of the Jews, the, the Savior of the world, the Son of God has come down, he's become, a, he's become flesh, he's become a man. What would we expect him to teach? What would he we expect the content of his sermon to be. We've already seen in chapter 4, verse 17, what the content of Jesus' preaching was. It was this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. In verse 23 of chapter 4, we see that Jesus was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. That's what he was teaching the people. And that's what we would expect Jesus to teach And that's what we should see the Sermon on the Mount as. It is a proclamation of the good news of salvation. Now we know that this is the whole point of the sermon because Jesus himself gave his own summary of what his teaching was, his earthly message. You remember in Luke chapter 24, after he rose again, he had a couple of Bible studies with his followers. And uh, what was the content of the Bible studies? He actually said, this is the message I told you when I was still with you. He actually summarized his earthly ministry to them. And you'll remember in Luke 24, verse 26 and 27, Jesus said this to two of his disciples. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, which which is the book of Moses? Which one is that? Genesis, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So Jesus went through the whole Old Testament showing that he was God's promised savior, God's Messiah. He was the Christ. He was the one who came to earth to fulfill all the prophecies that were given about him in the thousands of years beforehand. The Messiah was to come to earth to suffer and to die for the sins of his people and to rise again in glory. That is the gospel of the kingdom. Later on the same day, he met with the rest of the disciples and he he said this, these are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. In other words, here is the summary of my earthly ministry, guys. Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So that is Jesus' own summary of his message. That is the gospel of the kingdom, that all that was written about him beforehand must be fulfilled, that there must be repentance and faith. In this kingdom of God. That's actually why Paul himself, when he's summarizing the gospel, does the same thing, doesn't he? In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I declare to you the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, according to the prophecies that were given, that he was buried, 
that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, he appeared to many witnesses. So that is the summary of the gospel. That's what we'd expect Jesus to be teaching the people. And that is what the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with the Beatitudes, is all about. It will be an explanation of the gospel of the kingdom of God. So we were told that in the Old Testament, through many of the passages, we're told that the Messiah would be a teacher. He would be one who would lead the people of God and teach them. He would be a, a prophet who would speak to God's people. And God's people would listen to him. Just like sheep, sheep need to listen to the voice of the shepherd. For example, Deuteronomy 18 verse 18, God tells Moses, I will raise up for you a prophet just like you from among their brothers. I'll put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command him. So Jesus is that prophet like Moses. He's the one who speaks and we hear and we listen and we follow. Isaiah 11 is another example, describes the Messiah as one who would stand and counsel the nations and they would inquire of him and learn. And then there's countless passages throughout the Old Testament that describe God as like a shepherd and us like sheep. And God says that he will send a shepherd who will lead and guide his people. For example, Ezekiel 34 says this. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I'll bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel. See, in our passage today, we have God become man on a mountain of Israel, feeding his people, feeding his sheep. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and in the inhabited places of the land. I'll feed them in a good pasture and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down on good grazing ground and feed in the rich pasture of the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. So this should be reminding us of what Jesus himself said. He said, I'm the good shepherd and my sheep hear me. They, they follow me. They, they know the voice of the shepherd. He said, come to me, all you who labor and a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. We should, we should be hearing the echoes of Jesus' own teaching here in Ezekiel 34, which, of course, was written hundreds of years before Christ came. I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will judge between one sheep and another, between the rams and the male goats. This is the word of the Lord. So Jesus himself made a connection, didn't he, in John 11, when he called himself the good shepherd. He said, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. He is the good shepherd who feeds. He sat down to feed his people in good pasture. He leads us to rest. He saves the lost. He binds up the broken. He strengthens the sick. And so as we spend the next few weeks meditating on the, the Sermon on the Mount, let's uh, rest in Christ and his beautiful teaching, which will feed our souls. So we expect the Messiah to teach and we expect the content of the sermon to be the kingdom of God. And so here in the Sermon on the Mount, right at the beginning in these Beatitudes, Jesus is going to define for us what a person looks like who has been saved from sin by his death on the cross in their place. Jesus is going to describe what a person looks like who's been saved by his righteousness, it makes them right with God. And what kind of person is that? Who is he actually teaching? He's teaching his disciples who came to him. That's what it says. He sat down to teach them. So it's important to remember, as we read through the Sermon on the Mount, that it's primarily directed at the disciples of Christ, those who have turned from sin and put their faith in him. Now, we know that Jesus' teaching does you know, have a broader application to entire humanity at, a, at one level. But let's just try to remember that as we read through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is actually talking to his disciples. How do you become a disciple of Christ? 
You repent and then you believe. So we're assuming that the people listening to the sermon have repented and believed. So Jesus begins his sermon. He begins by saying, blessed. Now, what does the word blessed mean? Because uh, I'm sure the kids have never said to their friends, blessed are you for any sort of reason. We don't really use that word very much, do we? What does it mean to be blessed or, or to say blessed is that? Blessed are you. What does it mean? Well, the word itself is often used to just mean standard word for happy. Happy are you. Joyful are you. Although the meaning of blessed is a much wider meaning than that. To be blessed is to be happy because you have everlasting spiritual joy and satisfaction. To be blessed is to have peace in your heart that overwhelms you with joy. Peace like a river. To be blessed is to be somebody who has entered into the happiness of the Lord. And it's only through the truths of the gospel that we can find this blessedness. The truths of the gospel, that's the only thing that can truly root our deep and profound joy in God. That kind of happiness that we're all looking for rests upon a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And to be blessed, you know, everybody's trying to be blessed. You know, all people are looking for happiness and joy. It's the ultimate goal of humanity. It's not just Christians who are looking to be blessed. We all long for that, for that joy. We long deep down to have joy in our lives. And deep down, we all know that this joy won't come through what we own. Even though the world is telling us that, you know, if you get enough money, you get enough stuff, you're going to be happy. You're going to be joyful finally. And a lot of us act like we believe that. In fact, this week, my, uh, my boys ordered a, uh, a bunch of um, toys, Lego, through their own money uh, on the Internet. They ordered this big package and it's uh, coming from overseas. So it's going to take a while. And so currently they're waiting with this anticipation like uh, basically every day they've been asking me to check email updates about the status of the packages, right? So I'm sure in their own minds, in this situation, they're imagining that when these toys arrive, then they're going to be blessed. They're going to be joyful. They're going to be truly satisfied. But like, like all of us go through life learning, we, we imagine that things will make us happy, right? We all fall into that temptation. We all fall into that misunderstanding but we all learn in the end that possessions do not make us happy they do not make us truly joyful in our hearts so when we talk about being blessed we're not talking about the fleeting happiness you get with your possessions we're not talking about worldly things that are gone here today and gone tomorrow we're talking about that which is eternal solomon said in ecclesiastes he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. I might say, he who loves Lego will not be satisfied with Lego. In the end, our worldly possessions will not truly give us this joy. True blessedness lies in enjoying the eternal good in God. That is what we're looking for. And so when Jesus says, blessed are, he's talking about that eternal delight. When our souls truly delight in God and have eternal rest in Him. And when we, do, when we have that joy in God, we actually fulfill the purpose for which we were made, which is to know God and have peace and joy in Him. That's what it means to be blessed. That's what we're all looking for. So Jesus begins with the first beatitude, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now that word poor there, is uh, quite a specific word in Greek. So there's several words in Greek you can use. You remember that woman who came to the temple and she put in two mites and, and Jesus looked at her and said she's put in more than everyone else because she'd, she'd sacrificed so much, right? There's a word that's used to describe her that's different from the word that's being used here. The word for poor here is actually used of beggars. It's exclusively used of people who have nothing, who are begging for stuff. They're like, like the, the beggar Lazarus who was... Uh, outside the rich man's house. People who can only depend on the mercy and grace of other people. They're longing, they, they, all they've got is an empty hand reaching out saying, please give me money for food. 
So Jesus is talking about this when he says poor. The poor in spirit. Blessed are they. Now notice Jesus says the poor in spirit. He's not talking about physical poverty. He's not saying, he didn't say blessed are the poor in wallet, right? It's blessed are the poor in spirit. So what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, I'll tell you what I think it means and then I'll try and prove it afterwards. So to be poor in spirit means to be conscious of your situation before God as sinful and deserving only of judgment. And to be very sad over your sin and to reach out for him. Just like a beggar recognizes he has nothing in and of himself to feed his, his belly. He reaches out his hand for the, the mercy of those around him. Please give me food. Please give me money. So to be poor in spirit means to be to understand your own situation before God is sinful and deserving of only his wrath. Now, I believe that Jesus illustrates what it means to be poor in spirit very clearly in this parable that we're all familiar with. Parable from Luke chapter 18. Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. I believe here that Jesus is explaining to us what it means to be poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit means to despair of yourself, to despair of your own righteousness. And to throw yourself on the mercy of God alone. And you notice that Jesus gives this, this beatitude as the first one. It's the foundational one. Because being poor in spirit, like this tax collector, is the foundation to the Christian life. You have to confess and acknowledge your sin first before you go anywhere else. Without being poor in spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God. And we're going to see that as we go over this passage in the next few weeks, that all the other Beatitudes kind of lean on this first one. They kind of depend on it like the, the cornerstone of a building. The other stones of the building lean on the cornerstone. If you are not poor in spirit, if you are not repentant over your sin, you're never going to mourn over your sin or be meek or hungry for righteousness, or merciful, or pure in heart, or a peacemaker. In order to actually begin in the kingdom of heaven, you need to begin in spiritual poverty. Just like the tax collector, our hearts must be convicted by the Holy Spirit of our sin, of His righteousness, and the coming judgment. And we need to see ourselves without hope, spiritually poor. Now all of us know our own hearts. And all, all, I'm, all I'm saying is that we need to be realistic about our own sinful state. And therefore, our, we should be humble before God. I mean, look at people like the Apostle Paul. He himself said, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the worst there is. We should be looking at ourselves with sober judgment. Because that's the sort of person who, after you've given up all hope of salvation in yourself, that is the person who will come to Christ seeking salvation. And that's the beginning of the message of the gospel. And that's why throughout the New Testament you see the same pattern, right? You think of the other books of the Bible. You think of uh, 1 John. 1 John begins his letter by, st he starts off at the beginning. He talks about confession of sin and forgiveness. That's why Paul in Romans, when he's, he's writing out this massive tome, this massive volume of the, ex of the explanation of the gospel. What does he do for the first three chapters? talks all about 
the depravity of man, our sinfulness, our state before God, our, the wrath of God that is on us. He labors the point that everybody is sinful. Everybody has fallen short of God's glory. There's nobody who seeks God. There's nobody who loves God. None who does good. Not even one. There are no good people. He describes the human condition. If there's anyone who thinks that they're good, anyone of a proud spirit saying, look at me, I tithe. Those people are the ones who are outside the kingdom. They're the ones who are un under God's wrath. They're the ones who are truly without hope. And this is because there's no way for us to pay off our debt, our sin debt to a holy God. The wages of sin is death, and we all deserve death for our sin. Even, even angels who haven't sinned, the ones who are in front of God's throne crying out, holy, 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 even they throw themselves down. Even they cover their faces at the holiness of God. So we ought to recognize that our own sinfulness makes us like a, a dirty spot before a holy God. Because he's so holy, he will not even look on wickedness. And in the presence of this holy God, we should all, in humility, be crying out, Woe is me! I am a sinful man. I deserve to be destroyed. We should all be crying out to Jesus, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. That should be our condition, our humility. You notice, notice here that the gospel always starts with the bad news first. We need to know our spiritual state. We need to, to beat our chest and to cry out for mercy as unworthy sinners. And that's why Jesus uses the word here, poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit is to be absolutely dependent on the generosity of God. Just like to be poor in your wallet is to be dependent on the generosity of others. And without that acknowledgement... We will never receive the blessings of riches. Like if you think you're okay, then Christ will be of no help to you. Because the proud cannot see their own need. So they will not be saved. We have to call out for salvation in order to be saved. We need to recognize that we are sinners fallen in Adam. And we also ourselves sin daily against a holy God. So we are poor. And we cannot survive without his grace and mercy on us. That's why Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Again, not physical riches, but our spiritual state. We are spiritually poor. If God didn't give us the riches of his righteousness through Christ and the gospel, then we would remain in debt to him forever. And we would deserve the full judgment his holy judgment and hell fire. There's no way for us to pay off that debt. So to be poor in spirit is just to say, I acknowledge my situation before you, God. That's where we have to start. And that's why the other Beatitudes have their foundation here. And this is not just true of us at conversion. It's not just about when you become a Christian. It's about your daily walk with God. As you recognize your, your state of affairs, you recognize that, we are in a corrupt state. We absolutely depend on God's mercy and grace. We, we, do, we are poor in spirit because we acknowledge that all of our salvation, both past, present and future, is all of grace. Our walk with God is all of grace. Our spiritual growth will only continue if we recognize our need of him. This is Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, because this is a characteristic of all who are in the kingdom. So at the end of a successful ministry, Paul can look back and say, I worked harder than all of them, but not I. It was the grace of God in me. So we don't look to commend ourselves at any point. You know, there was a famous uh, missionary called William Carey. I wonder who's, who's heard of William Carey? Quite a few. He was a... An English guy lived in the 17, 1761 when he was born. He's a really good example of this. He was a fantastic missionary. He translated the Bible for multiple languages in India. And uh, God truly used him. He's a really good example of this. Do you know what William Carey's gravestone says? 
What did William Carey ask the people to write on his gravestone after he died? It says this, William Carey, born August 17th, 1761, died June 9th, 1834. Next line. A wretched, poor, and helpless worm. On thy kind arms I fall. At the end of his, uh, his ministry, he'd seen thousands of people come to faith. Like I said, multiple Bible translations. What was his own summary of his own life? I am a wretched, poor, and helpless worm. And on your kind arms, God, I fall. See, that, that reflects the heart of a true believer. One who is truly poor in spirit and relies on God's grace alone. Now, it's worth recognizing at this point that actually everybody is poor in spirit. Well, let me say that again. In actuality, all of us are spiritually poor. But not everyone is poor in spirit. Everybody in the world, everybody you know, is spiritually poor. But not everybody you know is poor in spirit. What's the difference? Well, even though we're all in the same place before God, we lack spiritual goodness. Therefore, we are spiritually poor. Not everybody recognizes that and is therefore poor in spirit. See, uh, we, we notice this. When uh, Jesus, Jesus was speaking to people, so the Pharisees had just said, well, they were opposing Jesus. And Jesus said this, this is very interesting, Mark 2, verse 17. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. <coughs> so the key point that Jesus is driving it is that everybody is spiritually sick. We, we are all spiritually poor. We are all needing a spiritual physician, a doctor who can save us from the sickness of sin. And there are no righteous people. There are no, there, there are no people who are actually righteous before God. Right? And Jesus said, I didn't come for the righteous. All of us are sinners. We have all fallen short of God's glory. But the difference is, is that there are those of us who don't recognize the depth of our depravity and our need for the Savior. And that was the Pharisees. They relentlessly opposed Jesus. And they were also, they were actually spiritually poor, but they thought of themselves as spiritually rich. So they attacked and they defied Jesus and they were in a spiritually bankrupt state. So what's the difference between them and we who put our faith in Christ? The difference is, is that they didn't recognize their poverty. They didn't understand that they were powerless and helpless and Morally unclean and unworthy before God. They thought of themselves as rich. So just like in the parable with the guys like saying, thank you, God, I'm not like this tax collector. I tithe. I, you know, I do these great things. This is what the Pharisees were like. They were experts in the law, but they were experts at misinterpreting the law and not applying it to themselves. And in the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to see Jesus take the law and apply it to their hearts. He's going to say, those who lust have already broken God's law. Those who hate in their hearts have broken God's law. See, the Pharisees were all focused only on external works. But the tax collector in our parable that we just read, he is someone who looked inwardly and he acknowledged his own sin and cried out for mercy. So to be poor in spirit is to despair of our own goodness and to seek the external righteousness of Christ. Now this is how, actually this is the, the method by which we obtain the righteousness of Christ. We are poor in spirit first. So we acknowledge our own sin. Or just like Jesus said, you repent. First of all, repent. And then we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is when His righteousness, His riches of righteousness is transferred to our account. Just as our poverty, our sinfulness is transferred to his. Now you might remember in the past I've used the uh, analogy of the bank accounts, right? Where your own bank account is fully in debt. You're minus 99999 in your bank account. And uh, 
The, the debt is accruing interest, so you, there's no way you're ever going to be able to pay it off. And yet, in Jesus' bank account, the account is filled, filled with money. It's full, it's 999, it's plus 9999, etc. And so in Jesus' account, there are untold riches of righteousness. And in the great exchange, Jesus takes his righteousness, and f- the first thing he does is he pays off our debt. Our sin debt to God. He pays all the pun- he takes all the punishment that we deserved. And so now we're neutral before God. We're okay now. But he, Jesus does even more than that. He takes more of his righteousness and, and applies it to our account and makes us rich so that we are, before God, righteous. That we look like we have performed the righteous works of Christ. In fact, in chapter 13, in Matthew 13, When Jesus is speaking about us after receiving his righteousness, he says this, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So we're not just going to be forgiven of our sins. We're also going to become righteous and shine like the sun. And it begins here in chapter five with those who are spiritually poor and acknowledge that poverty, crying out for the righteousness of Christ. They are the ones who will inherit the kingdom of God and finally be truly blessed. You notice Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Not not blessed will be the poor in spirit. Blessed are. That means we who trust in Christ now, we have the blessing now. It's not talking just about the future kingdom. So if you are not blessed right now in Christ, through your repentance and faith, you are not in his kingdom. And this kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? One time when Paul was teaching the Romans in chapter 14, he was telling them, don't judge your brother about what he eats or drinks. Paul says this in Romans 14, verse 17. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of God is when the poor in spirit receive righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's when we we know the depth of our own sinfulness and our inability to be saved without the mercy of God. We cry out to him for mercy. We strike our chest and humble ourselves before a holy God. We say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And those spiritually poor who have humbled themselves before God are blessed with his righteousness. Through faith in the the righteousness of Christ, his righteousness is transferred to our own account. We become suddenly rich before God. These are the people who go back to their house justified, made right with God. Not because of their own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ. The spiritually poor, those who are poor in spirit, we recognize that Christ is so precious in his work and his character, and we cling to Christ for salvation. So may we all be poor in spirit before him. I'm going to finish with uh, this verse from Isaiah today. Isaiah 57 says, Thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Well, may the Lord be pleased to bless us who are poor in spirit, to trust in him in this way. May he Bless his meditation, our meditation on his word today. May he enable us all to be poor in spirit, to trust in him alone. Let's pray, church. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word today. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you told us that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we want that blessedness. We want that joy. We want that satisfaction and eternal hope in you. I pray that you would help all of us to see our condition before you, that we are poor in spirit, that we are without hope, Lord, in our own righteousness. 
I pray that all of us would despair of our own goodness, Lord, that we would look to you for your mercy alone, that we would cry out, that we would beat our chest, that we would plead with you for mercy, for forgiveness for our sins. Lord, may this be a characteristic of our of our people here in Grace Evangelical, Lord. May this be something that people notice, that we are poor in spirit, that we desire you alone, that we long for righteousness through you alone, that we rely entirely on your mercy, that we are not proud, that we are not trusting in our own righteousness. May this be a characteristic of our walk with you, Lord God. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.